Thank you. Thank you. It's a one-man show. It lasts about three hours. There's only me on. There's nobody else on because I don't believe in having a support act or anything like that because I do not believe that you should pay good money to sit through an hour and a half of Enrico and his whistling ferrets before I come up. <laughs> So you're stuck with me, there's no support. I'm on all night, I'll be playing all these instruments at some time throughout the evening. It's not an auction, I'll be playing them all. <laughs> and because there's only me on, I do try and make it as interesting as possible. I vary the night, it's a very varied night. It's, it's a balanced sort of evening. I think we have a first half, then we have an interval, then we have a second half. It's balanced, isn't it? <laughs> And I try to do a lot of visual things as well, because I don't want you sat there getting stiff necks, just staring at one space all the time. So I'll walk up and down occasionally. <laughs> nothing very good, it's not choreography, it's simple walks, like, you know, <laughs> nothing powerful. And then I'll do real visual things towards the end, I'll do some smart stuff out. I lie naked in a bath of instant whip, <laughs> juggling with live edge jogs, that's really good. <laughs> And then we have a quiz. You'll love the quiz. The quiz is magic. They'll love the quiz. What that happens in the quiz is I get all the audience on stage and I sit out there and ask you all questions like... <laughs> very simple questions like... Um, history questions like... Captain Cook made three trips to the South Pacific. On one of these he died. Which one was it? <laughs> yeah, so there'll be all that sort of thing. There'll be questions and a quiz and the instant whip. And, and then at the end of the night, my piece de resistance, which I perfected specially for Lincoln. My piece de resistance, I do 27 and a half minutes of bird impressions. <laughs> I eat worms. <laughs> and then I go out and crap on a statue. It's great. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> You'll enjoy that. You wouldn't. But first of all, to begin the evening properly now, we'll have a sing song. I know you're sitting there saying we've paid to hear you sing, not sing ourselves, get on with it. But I want to give you a chance because my granddad has said always start with a good one. Smack them between the eyes, get them on your side, make them have it. So I'd like to start the evening with a chorus song called, it's from New Orleans, it's an old ragtime jazz type song called Gimme Dat Shaky Pudding. <laughs> I don't know what shaky pudding is, but apparently there's a lot of it about in Lincoln. <laughs> Particularly the Duke William, but never mind. <laughs> the chorus goes, give me that shaky pudding. Things is going to be all right, yes, massa. <laughs> Typical Lincoln accent, actually, isn't it? <laughs> give me that shaky pudding two or three times obdy night. And then I sing a couple of lines, and then we all sing, give me that shaky pudding. Things is going to be, you're not going to do it, are you? <laughs> Well, I'll manage on my own, see if I care. Here we go. After nine. One panic, February nine. I'll start with the chorus, give you all a fighting chance so you can join in. This isn't the chorus yet, so don't join in. Here we go, coming up. Yeah, that's the ladies chorus, okay, go. <laughs> give me that shaky pudding, things gonna be all right. I said now give me that shaky pudding, two or three times a night. Well, I don't like jelly, don't like cheese, but give me that shaky pudding, please. Give me that shaky pudding and things are gonna be all right. I said now give me that shaky pudding. Things are gonna be all right, I said, now give me that shaky pudding Two or three times a night, you know that shaky pudding Ain't like gold, no use saving it till you get old Oh, give me that shaky pudding Things are gonna be all right, all together now Zim well, you were great then. Fantastic. Three of you singing, the rest miming like buggery. I can see them. <laughs> give me that shaky pudding. Things are gonna be all right. I said, now give me that shaky pudding. Two or three times a night, you know that shaky pudding can't be beat. Keeps getting better the more you eat. Oh, give me that shaky pudding. Now things are gonna be all right. I said, now give me that shaky pudding. 
things are gonna be alright I said, now give me that shaky pudding Two or three times a night Eve was in the garden, up came the snake She said, bugger the apple for goodness sake Cause things are gonna be alright All together now, so that he had a little levity bum Tiddly old levity boom, hoo 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 Tiddly old lovely bop of the devil Tiddly up doodle like a leaf bum bum But it's a bop bum bum, it's a bop bum 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 Tiddly up bop 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 Tiddly had a levity boom Great More life in a dog's pelt I said, give me that shaky pudding Things are gonna be alright I said, now give me that shaky pudding Two or three times a night Coming round your house very soon Stir your shaky pudding with my spoon Oh, give me that shaky pudding And things are gonna be alright I said, now give me that shaky pudding Things gonna be alright I said, now give me that shaky pudding Two or three times a night I've just found out what your legs are for They're to stop your bum wearing out on the floor Oh, give me that shaky pudding how much? Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do now for you, if I can, if that's all right by you, is play some blues for you, man. And, uh, and I'd like to play them on this. It's a, it's a mouth organ, it's a, it's a black mouth organ, but you can play the blues on it. <laughs> and one of my heroes, one of the great heroes of all time, one of the real space freaks of all the time for me is a bloke called Sonny Terry. And he's absolutely the genius of mouth organ players, blues harmonica players. He is the king. Brilliant, he is absolutely brilliant. And he does a thing called the fox chase. Now the fox chase is an instrumental bit and within it you can hear all the noises of the fox hunt. You can hear the the horns blowing in the morning, getting everybody together going And you can hear all the dogs barking as well, you can hear all the little ones going And you can hear all the, all the big ones are going Only I can't do that, so what I'd like to do instead I'd like to do instead an instrumental called the Cop Chase And the Cop Chase is set in Manchester Well, there aren't many foxes in Manchester as you can imagine If you listen carefully Within this instrumental piece, you can actually hear a whole cop chase going on. You hear two blokes coming out of a pub after about 11 pints of journey into space. And they've got the rubber leg business, it's all going off all over the place, you know. And they decide to go and get some fish and chips. So you hear them open the door, they go into a fish and chip shop, and they ask for fish, chips and mushy peas three times. You can hear it all in the instrumental, you can hear it all there. There's no words to it, it's just music. You are you picking them out or are you taking this serious? <laughs> they get fish and smoke and they put salt and vinegar on it and you hear them going down the street eating and then they crumple up the paper and they throw it behind them now unbeknownst to them at that very moment there are two bogies in a jam butty round the corner, right? <laughs> now, that means two policemen in a patrol car, right? Not two bogies in a jam butty, right? And they see these guys and they start chasing them. The guys start running, the coppers are after them in the car, the fellas are running and they think there's only one way out, so they run down a back entry, down a ginnel, they run straight down the bottom, thinking they've got away from it because the car can't follow them. And down at the other end, there's a meat wagon full of blue bottles. They get grabbed and that is it, end of story. They get that felt and they're off into court before the beak and they get six. And the last thing you hear is the mother crying in court. It's all there in the tune. Right. <laughs> All right, don't believe me, you'll see, you'll see. Don't believe me. Like I can say it's called the cop chase. Here we go. <coughs>
This is a song that um, has been one of my favourite songs for a long number of years. People often write to me and ask me who writes my material. Well, all, all my stuff that I do usually is, is my own material, but every so often I do like to include somebody else's songs. And this is a song written by a bloke that I admire greatly called Ewan McCall. And Ewan McCall wrote another wonderful song called um, Dirty Old Town about Salford, a place next door to where I live. And this is a song he wrote when he was working on a program called Singing the Fishing. It was a, a radio ballad about fishermen and inshore fishermen and offshore fishermen of Britain. And he collected a lot of sayings and verses from fishermen and put them together and made this song up out of it. It's a beautiful song telling the story of a young boy's life when he first goes to sea. And it's called The Shoals of Herring. <laughs> With our nets and gear, we're faring Across the wide and the wasteful ocean Oh, it's there on the deep that we harvest and reap our bread That we're following the shores of heaven Oh, it was a fine and a pleasant day out of Yarmouth Harbour I was faring I was cabin boy on the sailing lugger Then to hunt the bunny shows of herring Oh, the work was hard and the hours were long and the treatment surely took some bearing There was little kindness and the kicks were many As we're following the souls of hell We fished the swath and the broken banks I was cook and I had a quarter sharing And I used to sleep standing on my feet And I dreamed about the shows of hell We left the home grounds in the month of June and for canny shields we soon were firing With a hundred crown of the silver dollars That we'd taken from the shoals of heaven Oh, you're up on deck, you're a fisher lad you can swear and show a manly bearing For your education, scraps of navigation While we're following the shows of hiding Oh, I earned me keep and I earned me pay and I earned the gear that I was wearing Sailed a million miles, caught ten million fishers We were following the shores of hell Night and day the seas were gathering Come wind, come hail, and the winter's gales 
Sweating and cold, growing up, growing old and dying He will follow in the shoals of hell Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of newspaper reporters ask me why I write loads of songs about kids. Because I do write lots and lots of little bits and pieces about childhood and children and being kids and growing up. And the reason why I write so much about kids is that I'm fascinated by kids and by the innocence that they have, that we lose somehow in growing up. Having grown up, we've lost it. They have still got it. Little kids are sort of dead honest. They don't lie. The, the, they'll say the first thing that comes into their mind, whatever occurs to them, they'll come out with it. They don't lie like we do. They're not learned to be deceitful and what have you. I mean, a little kid, for example, will see a bloke with his sort of ears with his, sort of stuck out like a taxi with its doors open, you know, and they'll say, <laughs> Dad, Dad, come along, come along, Dad. <laughs> that bloke's head's trying to fly away. Come along, Dad, he's trying to fly away. <laughs> You know, and the people, they'll just speak whatever comes into their mind. Come and sit to me, knee. Come and sit to me, knee. No, your breath smells. You've been boozing. <laughs> or a kid will run into his dad. Dad, come and look. Come and look, dad, dad, dad. Come on, come on, come on. What's up? I've just seen a flat dog. Come and look, dad. There's a flat dog out <laughs> How do you know it's a flat dog? There's another one pumping it up, dad. You can see him. No, that's not a flat dog. The little one's sick and the big one's shoving it to hospital, so that's what's happening. <laughs> I don't think the little one wants to go. It's pushing backwards, that lawyer can see it. <laughs> and I used to work on the buses in Manchester. I worked on the buses for ages as a bus guard. They call them conductors here, but the guards in Manchester, you need them. <laughs> and I was working on the buses and we came outside the antenatal clinic at Crumsall Hospital one day. And all the ladies were coming out and getting on the bus, and they were all very heavily pregnant, been in for checks and what have you. And the bus, the bus was absolutely jammed and, and solid with them. And, and there was this lady sat down on the back seat, on the long bench seat, with a little boy. And there was a woman strap handing, who was about eight and a half months pregnant, I suppose. And this woman with a little boy stood up and she said, Sit down, love, I'm, I know what it's like. Take the weight off your feet, sit down, love. Well, she said, Thank you, missus. Well, this woman's strap hanging with a little boy then, and the little boy could not take his eyes off this pregnant lady. He kept looking, going, Mum, Mum, Mum. And she said, shut up, shut up, leave over. No, Mum, 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 look, Mum. Mum, Mum, look. Shut up, shut up, look. Mum, Mum, no, no, Mum, look. And eventually, the pregnant lady leaned over. She said, what's the matter, little boy? He said, haven't you got a great big, huge fat tummy, you? She said, that's my little baby and I love him. He said, what do you eat him for then? <laughs> And I remember my own particular childhood with a great, a great degree of fondness. You know, my, my own particular childhood was, was um, very strange. But I, I remember sort of that innocent time of childhood and making your own amusements. You know, we made those fantastic fantasy games and making all your own amusements because we didn't have action men and tank, tank uh, toys and all this business. Then we had to make all our own, uh, you know, play things up like we used to push my gran on the fire and watch her jump off and that, you know. <laughs> Used to have chalk marks on the arthro to see how far she'd get, you know. And she, <laughs> she made the end, we'd give her a pension book back. We used simple stuff like that. And, and I thought about kids and grown-ups and all the things that grown-ups say to kids. And I decided to write a song about it all. And it's called The Some Things That The Grown-Ups Just Won't Tell You. And I want you to imagine I'm nine years old and I've got a moustache and my voice is broken and I'm a and I'm a red-hot guitar player, right? Why doesn't a ball stay up there when you throw it up in the air? That tortoise what we've got at school, why doesn't it grow hair? I wish I knew the answers, I don't think that it's fair There's some things that the grown-ups just won't tell you And 
Why don't little ball bearings grow up to be big? Why can't you get bits of bacon and make them back into a pig? They say they don't know the answers, but I think that's a whopping great big huge fib. There's some things that the grown-up just won't tell you. And where does all the fluff come from? You'll find between your toes. And how do those great big boogies climb right up inside your nose? <laughs> they must come in the night when you're asleep, I suppose. <laughs> but there's some things that the grown-ups just won't tell you. Does God go to the toilet? What gives you a cough? Why don't fish go rusty? What puts the smell in your socks? <laughs> if you undo your belly butting, will your bum really fall off? <laughs> There's some things up the road that just won't tell you. Why doesn't rain fall sideways or even upside down? Why don't your knees bend backwards? Why do worms live underground? You eat food all different colours Why does it all come out brown? <laughs> Next song I'm going to do eventually is about my family. Now, a lot of newspaper reporters ask me, they say, are you really that stupid? The only answer I can make it all honesty is yes, absolutely. And it's not really my fault because I come from a long line of nutters. <laughs> a long line of headbangers. I'm, I'm the ultimate progression in a long line of headbangers. I want to tell you about one of them now, uh, my sister. My sister is definitely not on this planet. <laughs> She's definitely nine pence to a shilling, my sister, I'll tell you. And I'm going to tell you some true stories now. And these are, honest to God, cross me heart, hope to die. Two stories. My sister used to work for a funeral director in Manchester. She used to help him answering the phone, typing the letters out, uh, showing people into the chapel of rest when they come to look at the stiffs, you know. And, um, <laughs> she used to help him laying him out in the back room as well, because I don't know if you know this, you know, they, they put rouge on you and things. I don't know if you know this, but they don't leave you as you are when they find you, you know, when you snuff it. <laughs> With the tire marks on your head and all that bit. You know, they, they, they do you up, you know, they put, they put rouge on, they paint the marks out, and if you've got false gnashes, they take them out and clean them and all this bit, and best whistle and flute on. Some people look better dead than they did when they were alive. You know? <laughs> and uh, she had two in one day, she had this big docker in from like Salford Docks, big huge fellow with muscles and he spit, enormous he was. And he was very brown bred, and a little insurance man, a man from the Prue, a dead small fellow with a tash light, and, and she took the teeth out and cleaned the hamsters, and she got them mixed up. <laughs> she, yeah, I put them in the wrong one. So, this docker went off looking very miserable about being dead because his mouth had all gone like that. <laughs> and his relatives came in the saying, Oh, what a shame, oh, terrible, isn't it? What a blessing he was took. <laughs> He'd never have lived here, he lived, would he? You know what I mean? <laughs> and the little insurance man went off looking deliriously happy about being dead. He'd been grinning like that. <laughs> and she had a... One came in from the morgue. It was not very good, this one. It looked, uh, it had um, been in post-mortem, you know, and it had, you know, all the blankets stitching up here. Knit one, pearl six, drop seven, it's all... <laughs> Mad lot. And she's got this one in, putting the rouge on, and the doorbell rang, so she covered it with a sheet, and she went to the door, and opened the door, and there's a bloke stood there, in a white coat, with all the pens sticking out of his top pocket, and the bleeper and everything, you know, the little black bag. She, he said, good afternoon, he said. Where is it? She said, oh, it's through here. She took him through. Pulled back the sheet, he took one look, he went, oh, boom, fell on the deck. He'd come to mend the typewriter. <laughs>
Let me tell you now about me, my stepfather. Right, my stepfather is another one in the family of headbangers, right? Now, my step, my mother married again, you see, after my dad died, and he's a smashing bloke. He's really, we've got a great relationship. We always got on very well. But the trouble is, he's Polish, you see, and he came over to fight with the Free Polish Army in the Second World War, and met my mum and all the rest of it. But we all understand him in the family, all my brothers and sisters and me, because we understand him, therefore. He's never bothered to learn to speak English proper as how I do, you know what I mean? <laughs> and this has led to a lot of problems. And he was coming home from work once in this car he had. He had got a Hillman Super Minx, right? And it was clapped out, absolutely clapped out. It was. He used to go down our road so slow that tortoises used to run out of back entries, jump on it, give it one, roll off and go away again. <laughs> And every so often the car would get broody and start making nests out of newspapers in the garage. <laughs> and it'd lay all these little German helmets that were running around in the back. <laughs> so my dad's driving home from work and he's there at Trafford Park waiting to go out onto one of the avenues there, waiting for the lights to change. And the car started to boil over. So this bloke came out of the way, you know, with the big grid outside. And he came out and said, what's up, Lou? My dad said, how I buggery know what buggery is buggery up with a buggery car? He said, I buggery step and buggery car, brum, 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 then buggery steam fly, buggery out and buggery no go. And he said, oh, he said, let's have a look. He said, uh, lift your bonnet up. So my dad took his hat off, you know, he said, <laughs> I said, no, I said, uh, he said, undo your front. So my dad went like that. He said, he said, no, no, he said, let's have a look inside. He said, and he looked, he said, well, you see, Lou, what you've got? He said, you've got a crack radiator. So my dad says, what's this buggery making mean, buggery crack lady? <laughs> he says, look, don't move. I'll do, I'll, I'll fix it for you, I'll get you home. He run in, he came out with a raw egg. Now this actually works. You can use this yourself if you ever get a crack in your radiator. It will get you home. The bloke said, now Lou, this is only a temporary measure, but it'll get you home. Because you crack an egg into your radiator and it'll boil it, I don't know if you knew this, but boil the egg and it'll jam it in the crack and it'll seal it up enough to get home. So the fella says, it'll get you home, temporary measure, crack. <laughs> My dad says, what are you making buggery do? You're feeding the buggery car. <laughs> You're feeding the buggery car. He said, I'm not feeding the car. He said, that'll get you home. It'll jam in solid. He said, and you'll be all right. He said, but it's only a temporary measure. Now, this is God's honest truth. My dad did not know the meaning of the words temporary measure. And I swear this is true. For three months after that, he got up every morning and cracked an egg into the radio. <laughs> right? It's true. Three months later, he's driving through Manchester, rush hour, half past five, traffic, nose to tail, jammed in. Albert Square, eight lanes of traffic, all side by millions of cars. He's at the traffic lights, they're going to green, puts it into get nothing. Steam, wheels collapse, boom, smoke, that's it. <laughs> Up come the bogeys from Brutal Street. No, 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 they come in. Policeman gets off his bike, walks round. As he's walking around the front of the car, he notices that the tax disc is a Guinness label stuck on the windscreen. <laughs> Well, my dad thought the car doesn't earn any money, why should it pay tax, you know? <laughs> and as he's walking around again, he notices also that the tread on the tyres has been drawn on with a magic marker. <laughs> so he comes round to... He comes round to the side and he says to me, Dad, right, he said, uh, you mind getting out, sir? Mind your window down? So my dad took the window off and put it on the side. <laughs> He said, just before you get out, he said, uh, try your handbrake, please. He said, I pulled the handbrake on, the washer started going. You know. <laughs> he said, press the on, he pressed his own light and all the lights came on, flashed, wipers, all of it. He said, right, he said, uh, just get out, sir. Dad climbed through the door light. <laughs> he said, now, he said, taking out his notebook, he said, I must warn you, he said, you do not have to say anything, but anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence against you in the court of law. Now, exactly what happened? Me dad says, how I buggery know what buggery makes you buggery. <laughs> It's buggery traffic lights, I buggery coming home, it's buggery red. I buggery stop, it's no buggery go because it's buggery red. It's buggery yellow, I still no buggery go. It's buggery green, I no buggery go because the buggery car is buggery buggery. It's no buggery stop. <laughs> buggery bank, smoke, it's buggery steam, finish. The copper put his notebook away, he thought I'll be up all night with this fellow. Not... <laughs> he said, right, let's get you going. You can bugger off into Salford, let them do you. Come on. <laughs> so... He said... He said, right, he said, uh, lift your bonnet off. So my dad went like this. Let's have a look inside. So he looked in, lifted the, he could not believe it. This copper looked, he could not believe his eyes. There was poached egg everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's 
not broken down, it's eggbound this bug, is it? <laughs> I would now like to tell you about my, my mum. Now, my mum is another in the rogues gallery of headbangers in our family. I mean, my mother is amazing. I mean, I love her dearly, she's, she's great, but she is just unbelievable. I, I used to work on the buses in Manchester as a bus conductor, and we used to go to Bury on the old 35s. Now, Bury used to be well, very well known for black puddings. He used to do marvellous black puddings, and Bury, Bury black puddings, he used to call them. So, I bought some black puddings. Now, my mother has hated black puddings ever since she was a girl and she got frightened by one. <laughs> it was... It was a dark night, he was carrying them funny, that's all there was to do. <laughs> she kicked them over a wall and ran off, but ever since then, she's... <laughs> so I put them... I put them on the table, you see, I said, uh, Hey, Mum, will you cook these? She came in and looked, she said, Ooh, she said, ooh, black put, ooh, she said. Ooh, I can't stand them, she said, ooh, she said, I couldn't cook them for you. I said, why not? She, ooh, she said, I ate them. I said, well, just cook them for me, for me tea. She said, I, I don't know how to do it. I have no idea. So I went next door and asked Mrs. Simmons, who used to live next door. I said, how do you cook black puddings? She said, you do them like you do potatoes. You can boil them or you can fry them. So I went back, I said, ma'am, she says, you do them like you do potatoes. Do you know what I got for my tea that night? Black pudding chips. <laughs> She'd been two hours peeling them. <laughs> Very rubbery skins on these. She's it looked like a plate of dominoes. I said, what's this? <laughs> They're all double sixes. I'm knocking, I can't. <laughs> a fellow came round next door to put an aerial on the roof of the house next door, right? He's halfway up the ladder. My mother decides she wants him to help her doing something. She grabs hold of the ladder. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> the fellow holding onto the gutter by his teeth, going, this is! Let go of the bloody ladder! I'm going to go get all off in a minute. She said, can you come down? He said, oh, come down in a minute. And she let go and he came down in his white overalls. He said, oh, missus, he said, what's up? She said, my washing lines fell down. He said, well, it wasn't me. She said, I know that. She said, but I saw you had a drill. She said, could you drill all in the wall and put a peg in it for me so I can put my washing line back up? He said, I will do, missus, but promise me, don't shake me, lad, no more like that. So he gets his drill, two seconds, zoop. Big peg and all, boom, hook in it. He said, there you go. So my mother got the washing line, fastened it. She said, thanks very much, love. She said, I don't know how I can help you. No, he said, it's all right, miss. No, she said, I'm really grateful. She said, I'll get my clothes up now. He said, no, just give us a cup of tea. <laughs> she went mad, my mum. She's got no sense of humour when it comes to that at all. No sense of But my mother, I mean, I, I do love her and, and she loves me, but she'd be the first to admit that she's... I mean, she's done more to mutilate the English language than any person I know. Honestly, last Christmas, for a present, I bought her a Waterford crystal vase, a little one like that. And she said, oh, thanks, she said. She said, your Uncle Harry, now my Uncle Harry, is a famous Manchester character called Harry Carpet. He's an unofficial wine taster for Yates's Wine Lodge <laughs> and a sudden fall down merchant. <laughs> Rubber legs after half past ten. You know, he's, a, he's known as Horry's Uncle Harry in certain areas, but he's always... <laughs> He's always winding my mother up and telling her all sorts of things, and she believes him. So she said, your Uncle Larry said you can always tell if it's real crystal, because when you hold it up to the light, you can see all the colours of the rectum. <laughs> <laughs> now, apparently she said this in the butchers while he's doing some chops. He's nearly lost his... <laughs> She's brilliant. I went home last, last year, I went to see her at summertime, and she said, I'm glad you've come to see me, she said, because you can help me, she said, for a change. She said, um, stay around, she said, because I've got some furniture coming through the post. <laughs> now, I've got a very funny imagination. I see things visually a lot, of that, and I had a vision of four postmen with a wardrobe coming down our street <laughs> with a big stamp on it, you know, and I thought, I said, what are you talking about? Furniture coming through the post. She said, don't be stupid, you know what I'm talking about. I got it from the mail order catalogue, she said. It's for the barbecue. <laughs> I said, what barbecue? Now, I better point out that my mother lives in the same house I was born into in Crumsell, in a terrace street, right? With a backyard. I said, what are you going to do with the barbecue? 
She said, your father's going to whitewash the backyard and we're going to have a barbecue there and chairs and tables. I said, mother, you're actually going to cook meat outside on a fire in our street? She said, yes. I said, you know what'll happen if the neighbours around here smell meat? They'll go berserk. <laughs> Square meals and oxo around our place, you know what I mean? She said, don't be stupid, you can help me for a chair. I said, mum, I said, are you really going to eat in the yard outside? You're going to cook? She said, yes. I said, it's a funny thing. I said, do you remember as soon as I got a bit of money in this job, we knocked down the old outside toilet. Do you remember that? And I built you a toilet and a bathroom in my old bedroom in the house. She said, yes, why? I said, it's funny. I said, when we were poor, we used to crap in the yard and eat in the house. It's the other way around now. I said, it's <laughs> She said, I'll wash your mouth out with soap, Al Michael. That's no way to... She said, you can stay here and help me. She said, this furniture, she said, it's coming through the post and it's a kit. She said, your Uncle Larry said, it, it, it's called suppository furniture. <laughs> I said, what? She said, it's called that because you put it up yourself, he said. I don't know. She said, it's... <laughs> Do you remember the power cuts? Do you remember the power cuts of... Was it 71, 69? It's 71, I think it was. All them power cuts. My baby brother was two at the time. She gave him garlic so we could find him in the dark. <laughs> Come here, John, have another sweetie. I don't like them sweeties. <laughs> We're all walking around the house going... <laughs> She's brilliant. Oh, the best one. My mother, when I was 15, I used to come home from school and I'd be doing my homework on the table while my dad was having his tea, you know, he'd be there, like, doing his pools or doing his horses, like, his, his Yankee accumulators, sixpence, and then all permed, all these horses. If they'd ever come up, they'd have killed every bookie in the country that had done them out. <laughs> and he's there doing it. And my mother sat opposite him. He's there, ma'am, me doing homework. Kids all sat watching Muffin the Mule on the show. <laughs> and my mother, if she was ever going to say anything really, like, anything about sex or anything like that, or who'd gone to prison in our street, if she was going to say anything like that, she'd always like whispered like that. <laughs> because a lot of people in Lancashire, women in Lancashire, could do that lip reading bit with working with the mill machinery, you know, because they have to do it over the noise of the machine. Like that. <laughs> so, there we are. And she says to me, Dad, Lou, she said, Lou. He said, what's the buggery matter? The buggery. <laughs> she said, Lou, she said, Oh, she said, we've had some trouble today, she said, in the corner shop, you know. Because we used to live next door to the corner shop. She said, terrible trouble, she said. Uh, that Mrs Johnson from down the road, you know, the new woman who moved in just a bit. She, oh, she was upset. She was so upset today. We had to sit her on a sugar bag and give her a drink of tea. She said, oh, she was terrible today. She was very upset, you know. Because, you know, and I'm listening by now, I think. <laughs> she said, you know, her and her husband, they've been trying for a family, you know. I've always loved that expression, trying for... How do you try for family? <laughs> On your marks, get set, <laughs> go. Oh, he's fell off again, Fred, lift him back. <laughs> so always fascinating. So anyway, there's my mum. Been trying for a family, you know, for four years, you know, and she's not had any, uh, any, any, you know, she's not had any trouble. Anyway, she went to see one of them, um, she went to the anti-naval clinic today. <laughs> She went to see one of the surgeons, you know, this, and he, he gave her an interval exhumation, you know. <laughs> and uh, she was so upset at what he told her. She was so... She, he shouldn't have told her. She was crying her eyes out. Now, apparently, this doctor had told this poor woman that she had an inadequate passage, and if she had a child, it would be a miracle. My mother said, you know what she said? She's got a haddock in her passage. <laughs> And, and if she has a baby, it's going to be a mackerel, that's what he said. <laughs> I mean, that's the he says, I buggery hate mackerel, he's buggery terrible. Says, Bones stick in the teeth. I'm tell you about... I'm going to tell you about our dog now. Our dog is... Well, it's the last of the headbangers in our family, really. It's a genuine headbanger. It's my mother's fault, you see. My mother said, now you've all grown up and left home, me and your dad are like a dog to talk to. 
I've got her dog, she's talked to it, she's driven it potty. Driven it <laughs> she said, it's one of them old English sheep dogs, the dog, you know, the she said, we'd like one of them dogs that you see on the, the adverts, you know, one of them big fluffy dogs, you know, one of them Jorex dogs. <laughs> Said, Mother, I said, you mean a Julux dog? Oh, she said, your father's been getting it wrong all these years. She said. <laughs> I used to wonder what he was doing going up our stairs with two tins of emulsion on a Friday. <laughs> I thought he must be standing on him. I don't know what was he doing. <laughs> anyway, I got to. I go to this dog, right? Now, it is mad. It thinks it's a human being. Because I've been talked to so much, it thinks it's a human being. I'm driving my car, right, with the kids in the back, and I've got a kid on the side and the dog in the middle, and it's just sat there talking. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And if you drive too fast, it goes. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> and it sits, it sits watching television. It watches all the programmes, it's got favourites. And if it doesn't like the programme, it gets up and it changes the channel with its nose. It goes, <laughs> And what annoys me is it never asks anybody else if they want to change over. <laughs> it watches Mastermind, it tries to answer the questions on Mastermind. It's sat there going, or off. Or off, off. Or off. Pass. Or off. <laughs> but it's a big, fluffy, daft idiot of a dog. They're about this big, you know, big and all fluffy and mad, like a big, horrible, smelly mat it is. But it loves people, it actually loves people, so as soon as it has a key in the door of my mum's, it starts to run down the lobby. Now, the lobby is about 48 yards long, covered in lino, and the dog's got big fluffy feet like feather dusters. It's running like the clappers. <laughs> and there's bugger all happening, he's running. <laughs> and then eventually, because of friction or something, it starts to get a bit of speed up. And halfway down the lobby, it's doing about 30 miles an hour, and you see this thought cross its mind, it sort of goes, I can't stop. <laughs> and it throws its bum into reverse and comes sliding towards you, sat up like that. You open the door, there's two underweight a dog flying at you. Step to one side, it goes off down the steps like that. People going past them, buses think it's tap dancing, they're throwing money at you. Brilliant, look at this dog here. It's crackers. Definitely. And I'll tell you another thing. This dog of ours has got... <laughs> got a terrible habit of sniffing people's genitals. <laughs> do you know dogs like that? <laughs> what do they get out of that at all? Can you... I wouldn't want to do it to them, would you? You know. Come here, Spot. Come here. <clears throat> Come on. I don't know, but our dog loves it. The dog's in there. <clears throat> Old ladies bending over the fridge in the corner shop. <laughs> You've got to drag him out the raspberry ripple, the lion again. <laughs> Except one old lady, she said, George, you might have warmed your hands up first, she said. <laughs> Don't bluff it. <clears throat> Give up. <clears throat> Mind you, it's not as bad as them little ones that fall in love with your legs. like cling on rubber monkeys, aren't they? <laughs> and don't try and shake them off because they love it. Get off! Get off! Get off, will you? When, <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was a kid, there's a bloke who used to live down our street that bred Jack Russells, you know, the little brown and white ones? Many a morning I went to school, one each leg couldn't get rid of it. Get up! Get up! Kids at school are saying, belting pair of boots you got there hard in. But our dog is not a... Our dog is not a cling on it. It's a, a sniff. It's a good job it isn't a cling on, because it'd throttle you, you know. You... And this is true. This is what I'm going to tell you now. It's, it's dead true. I mean, mother... We were all brought up as, as Roman Catholics, right? Left left footers, you know. Um, and we, 
Well, my mother, even though she's a Roman Catholic, still believes that if you're in a race, you back as many horses as you can. So she has all the different religions in our house, and she sort of goes to all the churches on a Sunday and stuff. She's all around the place. And our house is always full of religious sort of people, ministers and what have you. And about two years back, the vicar from the church around the corner from us, he was in our house collecting for the jumble sale. Now, I must tell you, my mother wears glasses, but she does not like anybody to know she wears glasses. So she's always taking them off and forgetting where she's put them. Either that, or she's always sticking them on top of her head and forgetting they're there. Twice, to my knowledge, she's been to the hairdresser's, got under the dryer and they've melted. <laughs> so there's the vicar, and my mother is in the glory hole under the stairs. You know, where all the rubbish is chucked. And she's there getting stuff for the jumble sale. And this poor vicar's got arms full of all the rubbish that's been around every jumble sale in the north of England. The Monopoly set with the ship missing, no community chest, only one hotel and no houses, you know. The jigsaw of the ship in full sail, only half the pieces are missing, so there's no sea, no sky. When you put it up, it looks like a wet anky. Got the Rupert book, the rubber dagger, the little money box that you twist its ears and it eats all the money. It's got the skipping rope with no rope, no angles, just the ball bearings, you know. Roller skate and a boxing glove. Someone's gonna have a lot of fun with that, aren't they? Skating around in circles, punching themselves. And all the girls' crystals and the bunty annuals and the old eagle annuals all piled up and teddy bears with no eyes and the squeaky gun all jammed up and he's holding this lot in his arms full here and holding it all together with his chin just about. My mother keeps diving under and crawling around this cubby hole in the dark, you know. And there's the vicar stood with his hands full, totally helpless. And our dog looks out the back kitchen and thinks... Oh! Here must be my birthday! And she's got very soft, fluffy paws, so he can't hear her. She pads all the way down the lobby and gets the nose right in. <laughs> now, the last thing the vicar's seen is my mother disappearing below him out of sight. <laughs> and the dog's pushing him down the lobby going... <laughs> and she's going, Mrs Harding. <laughs> Mrs Harding. Mrs. And my mother, talking about her glasses, says, when I find them, I'm going to tie them behind my ears. <laughs> That's true. Absolutely, 100% true, that is. <laughs> Honestly, I came home that night, there's a vicar-shaped hole in our front door. <laughs> well, this is a song that <laughs> I was going to do about a quarter of an hour ago, I suppose. It's a song all about my family in a way, or any family I suppose it's called, you just can't beat this family life. There's no chorus, so don't join in. Right. Here we go. Granny's in the bathroom smoking dope, there four hours so she's looking for the soap. <laughs> Smoke's coming out through the bathroom door, cats lying stoned on the landing floor. <laughs> oh, don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife, cause you just can't beat this family life. Sister's window's got a big red light, lots of men friends every night. Ladder runs up to a windowsill, all you can hear is the ringing of a till. Don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife Cause you just can't beat this family life Up in the attic, little brother Tom Trying to make a neutron bomb He's played with his chemistry set for years That's why grandma's got four ears Don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife Cause you just can't beat this family life Mother put an axe in her boyfriend's head He's buried in the cellar, no one knows he's dead So many bones in the family cupboard Gonna start calling her Mother Hubbard Don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife Cause you just can't beat this family life
daddy goes out most every night Climbing roofs in the pale moonlight They say he's like Robin Hood a bit But he robs from the rich and keeps it <laughs> Don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife Cause you just can't beat this family life Well, me granddad's made his own moonshine Metal polish and turpentine Gave some to the dog and it started to cough Sparks from his arse and his fur fell off <laughs> Don't you give me no trouble, don't give me no strife Cause you just can't beat this family life Just can't beat this family life Just can't beat this family life Thank you. Classical music. I'd start. You didn't know it was an evening of classical music, didn't you? <laughs> uh, I'm going to do one of uh, Rippy's Corsets Off's numbers, and then. <laughs> no, actually, I was going to do one of Beethoven's numbers, but he never does none of mine, so I thought, well, bugger it. <laughs> Instead, what I would like to do for you now, actually, if I can play it on this instrument here, I'm going to play one of Tchaikovsky's numbers, one of Tchaikovsky's better known numbers that you probably know quite well, the 1812 Overture. I'm good. You think I'm kidding or what? I'm going to do the 18, 12 overture, but I'm going to do the short version, because I don't know if you know this, he wrote two versions of everything. He wrote a long version and a short version. And he used to prefer the short version himself, because he used to get out a puff on the mouth organ blowing the long ones. <laughs> so I'm going to do the short version of the 18, 12 overture, and with no words in it. There are no words in it, because I don't know if you know the words to the 18, 12 overture. The... They're very boring, they're really just... It's just Napoleon crying all the time, you know. <laughs> cold feet and snow and moaning about chillblains. So, I'm going to do for you now the 1812 Overture, complete with bombs, explosions, the works. You get the full Monty with this in about half a minute. Here we go. <laughs> 1812 Overture. And now for all pop lovers in the audience, a song that was in the hit parade about a year back, it was uh, called Wim Away. First made famous by a bloke called uh, Carl Denver and later recorded by the, the Bum Boy Darts Band, I think they were called. <laughs> and... <laughs> if you feel like joining in, if you feel like joining in, there's a, a yodeling bit in the middle, you can all get stuck into that if you like, you know. Or if you don't feel like joining in, just grab bits of the person sat next to you. It doesn't help the song, but it gives me something to look at while I'm sat here. Yes. And I'll play this as far away from my body as I can, and if it slips about, there'll be another yodeling chorus. And then... <laughs> and then here we go. Wim away. It's a draft bus we put away, put away, put away. Twelve pints of draft bus we put away, we put away, we put away. All the pavement, the rubber pavement as we went wobbling on. All the pavement, the rubber pavement as we went wobbling on. A chicken chow mein to take away, take away, take away. A chicken chow mein to take away, take away, take away, 
On the river, on the bridge, on the river, the lion roars tonight. Yoruba! On the river, on the bridge, on the river, the lion roars tonight. Ruth! <laughs> See his false teeth swim away. Swim away. <laughs> Expense, but at great risk to life and limb, I'm going to play this for you. I don't know what it's called. I think it's a thing with strings that you whip with these only them. <laughs> what do you think of it, Arthur? Well, I think it's actually a toast rack from Scunthorpe, I'd say. <laughs> Exploding breadboards. No, actually, I think it's a giant egg slicer. I don't know what it's called. I think it's called Armored Dulcimer or something. I'm going to play some Irish tunes on it. The first one's a slow air called Bula Vogue. Didn't mean a lot, that to you, I see, right? <laughs> but I have to explain it's a slow air because I forgot to tell them that in Birmingham and they thought, because I was playing it slow, I didn't know it. <laughs> They're all sat there going, oh, he doesn't know it like, you know. Because they've got Liverpool accents in Birmingham. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the second one's called, if uh, work was in bed, I'd sleep on the floor. And the third one's called, don't kick the dog up the bum when you've got your fingers in his mouth. Something like that. <laughs> Settle down, it's art, this. Right. You ready, Hans? Right. <laughs> Interesting characters of Britain, number seven in a series of 394. <laughs> the ladies' man, otherwise known as the great Chatsby. 
a two and a half legged mammal that resides in various parts of the country. <laughs> Some of you must know these characters. There's a pub not far from here called the Duke William and they all get in there, millions of them. <laughs> millions of them, the wine bar cowboys sailing in there on the hunt. And they've all got the same uniform on. They've all got the shirts open down to the navel, the gold bullion medallion hanging down here. All the rings all over their hands, the gold identity bracelet round here with Morris on it. <laughs> as soon as you say that, all the Morrises in the audience will go, oh, it's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> all trying to take the bracelets off an item, you know. And they've got those big watches on you, know, big huge watches, like them big things with like, they've got all they can tell, all, um, digital, rotary, electric, and all this business, and you can press them and they'll tell you the month and the date and the time and the year and what the weather's like in Nicaragua, you know, and they'll get your wrist started on a frosty morning and all this sort of thing, you know. So I believe. Mind you, I've heard it's better than a goblin tease, mate, but I don't know anything about these things, because, because, um, I just get up and put the kettle on, you know. And they come in the bar and they've got these trousers on. Have you seen the trousers they wear? They're amazing. The spray-on trousers. You can't buy them. You've got to be born in them. They're amazing. <laughs> From behind, it's like two rabbits in a poacher's bag going down the street. <laughs> and they come in. And it's marvellous. A big bunch of keys. Huge big bunch of keys. And they sort of waltz across the bar like looking at... And these guys are absolutely amazing. They've got this inbuilt radar apparatus. They can find an unattached girl at 40 miles. It sort of goes... <laughs> drops this bunch of keys with the fob on it that says, Jensen, Dormobile. <laughs> <laughs> Jensen, Dormobile. It's a minivan on four piles of bricks around the corner. <laughs> it's absolutely clapped out, absolutely clapped out. And it, you know, as it showed up on these bricks and sort of, half past ten he gets a bit, they go in the van and it starts moving on its own, you know, and drunks going past, bless themselves as they're walking past the van. <laughs> and he comes in, drops the keys and he looks at this girl, finds this girl on her own and he, he leans in and this voice is developed by eating broken glass and old 78s and Brillo pads. He leans in and he goes, hi. Sounds like a frog with his bum on fire, doesn't it? <laughs> he says, uh, dead original, he says, uh, tell me, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? I'm with my friend, Dory. <laughs> oh, gee, that's, that's great. I mean, where is, where's Dory? She's in the ladies again. I told her about that at work. We work at the ice cream factory down the road and she's always sitting on them boxes of lollies. She's got systematitis. <laughs> and then he begins the great Chatsby routine. He looks her very deeply into the eyes, smiles with his sort of vivis of patty moustache, just crinkle up the corner of his mouth. And he says, tell me, uh, haven't we met someplace before? You know, I mean, were you in Ibiza this year on Mystique, or did you go skiing, or anything like that, or were you in Bermuda? No, me and Dory went to Cleethorpes. <laughs> we caught crabs off the pier. <laughs> and he steps back a bit, then he says, yeah, that's great, yeah. <laughs> he says, listen, you know, okay, maybe we haven't met somewhere before, but I looked across the room tonight and I saw you and I saw you seeing me seeing you and I just came across and I don't know, there was just something about us, you know, babe, I mean, I just mean, you know, I mean, you and I were just like ships that pass in the night, you know, across this great ocean of tears and I think sometimes ships that pass in the night should maybe say hello to each other, you know. Are you a sailor? <laughs> you don't look like what? No, no, it's just a figure of speech. Look, look at, look at, how about I, I buy you a drink, okay? Yeah, all right, I'll have a drink. Uh, I'll have a pint of traffic lights. <laughs> a pint of what? You never heard of traffic lights? It's a pint of traffic lights. You get uh, equal parts of creme de menthe, uh, dram buey, and cherry brandy. And you put them in so they don't disturb each other, and you get red, yellow, and green, and I'll drink it. 
A pint of Travelites. Yeah, I love them. They're great, they are. Three of them and anybody's. Oh, right. Uh, Pedro. Uh, three pints of traffic lights for the lady here. And I'll have, he looks in his wallet. <laughs> A glass of ice water, okay? Ciao, baby. Ciao. Ciao. What a load of rubbish. He's a welder all week, Saturday night. Ciao. It's the waiter comes back. Three pints of traffic lights. She puts them down her neck, one after the other. Wallop, wallop, wallop. He said, are you, are you okay? Yes, yeah, she said they're very nice, them. Um, I like them. Um, good. You gonna buy me another one? Another pint of traffic lights? Yeah. It'd get you drunk, wouldn't it? Who you call him, wouldn't it? It's bum face, eh? <laughs> Well, you've got to end a story somehow, haven't you? You know what I mean? I just... <laughs> and I wrote a song. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll never live. I wrote a song called A Ladies' Man, and it's about one of these ladies' men who comes to a very sticky end, okay? <laughs> you... <laughs> you get me in trouble, you lot, you know. It's not me, this. A Ladies' Man, okay. Right, here we go. Not here to enjoy yourselves, right. He was a ladies man, wah wah, a real Don Juan, wah wah. Round all the dance halls and all of the discos, all of the bar rooms and all of the bistros, with wives and sweethearts, sisters and widows, and even the occasional gran. From nine to five, wah wah, to keep himself alive, wah wah. He worked at the co-op slicing bacon, Sending the ladies home hearts aching With nostrils flaring and pupils dilating At the way he packed their pork <laughs> it's, it's, There's nothing rude about that you know? <laughs> With his brill cream hair, mohair suit Cigarette holder and blue suede shoes Like the man that got into the chicken coop He was a ladies man He was a married man Wah wah This deceitful Don Juan Wah wah while his wife got ready for the Weight Watchers Club He told that he was going playing darts down the pub Kept his Don Juan suit in a wooden tub And got changed in the garden shed Seven nights a week Wah wah This scunthorpe chic Wah wah Oiled his toupee and trimmed his tash Pressed his suit till it looked dead flash And since he was going off out on the mash Made sure he got his packet of four <laughs> His real green dead Moa suit, cigarette holder and bruise when you like the fox that got into the chicken coop. He was a ladies' man at Z Topicana. Wah wah. He met a lass called Anna. Wah wah. With his billiard chalk stuck behind his ear, he fixed his face in a seductive leer. But a <laughs> but a packet of scratchings, a pint of beer, some crisps and a pickled egg. All through. The night, wah wah, he held her tights, wah wah. <laughs> Talked of love and her beautiful eyes, said they'd dance in the park neath the starry skies, and with breathy kisses and tender sighs, they went to get a donkey jacket, and his blue green hair, mower suit, cigarette holder and blue suede shoes, like the fox that got into the chicken coop. He was a ladies' man in the Corporation Park, wah wah, near the balls hut in the dark, wah wah. He tickled her knees and squeezed her hips, kissed her ears and nibbled her lips, <laughs> tickled her knees and touched her fingertips, and reached for his packet of three. He <laughs> lost one. He. <laughs> he. <laughs> he undid. Her dress, wah wah, slid his hand inside her vest, wah wah. But what he found was a real shocker, cause instead of a soft, warm pair of knockers, was the hairy chest of a very gay dock root shade. Just an hour before, with his little green hair, more suit, cigarette holder, and blue suede shoes, like the fox that got into the chicken coop. He was a ladies' man. He turned and ran, wah wah, this confused man, wah wah. 
But before he'd reached the pitch and put, he was grabbed at the back of the parkies hut, and without benefit of clergy or an if and but, became a man's man as well. <laughs> now, this lady is man. Wah, wah, one time Don Juan, wah, wah, stays in by the fireside every night. Away from the dance halls and bright city lights And strange ladies with hair growing out through their tights <laughs> And a bad case of barber's rash <laughs> With his broken hair, no more moir suit No more cigarette hold, no more blue suede shoes Like the fox that met a bulldog in the chicken coop He once was a ladies' man For Thank you. This, this is um, a serious song, and it's a song about the First World War, and it's about a, a group of lads called the Accrington Pals. In um, 1916, the generals found that they were running out of men to send before the cannon and, and have mown down. So they decided to adopt a new recruiting policy and they got all the Lord Mayors of a lot of towns, particularly in the north of England, to get lads from the same villages and the same areas and the same streets, that had been to the same schools and worked in the same factories, to come together and they formed the Pals Battalions. And there was the Sheffield Pals, the Leeds Pals, the Barnsley Pals, Manchester, Salford. And Accrington was the smallest town in Britain to send a full battalion of a thousand men to the army. And 750 of these lads came from an area right in the centre of the town of about 20, 30 streets. And they joined up and went away to war. And on the first day of the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the generals told them all it was going to be a pushover. And at the signal that morning, they'd all walk over the top and there'd be this big push and they'd take over the German trenches. What the generals didn't know was that the Germans were in deep underground bunkers. And as soon as our lads started going over the top, the Germans came up and just wiped them down in wave after wave after wave. Of 100,000 men that went over the top that day, 22,000 were killed and 350,000 were wounded. And of the Accrington Pals, of those 750 lads, 285 were killed and 350 were wounded. And there wasn't a family in Accrington that had not lost a father, a son, or some relative. And the town was absolutely devastated and it's said that it's never really got over it till this day. And this song just tells a simple story of what happened to seven of the lads that were in the Accrington Pals that I knew had been in it from having gone to the library and researched the material for the song. And I do this in a spirit of anti-war, if you like, because I've travelled all over the world and to me the most stupid thing that can ever happen to anybody is war. And I have actually worked out what causes wars now. I've got a theory of history that's going to go down in the textbooks. Wars are caused by politicians. If there were no politicians, there'd be no wars. So I'm forming my own political party called the STP Party. Stuff the politicians. <laughs> and in that spirit, I'd like to dedicate this song to the town of Accrington and the Accrington Pals. I do it also because I've never ceased to be amazed at the way in which old generals will send young men happily off to die in battle. Here it is, the Accrington Pals. <laughs> smoky little streets They were pals from childhood days Climbing trees and running through the fields And they all played together Through the turning of the years Sharing their laughter, sharing all their fears The seasons saw them growing And the seasons passing turned them round Changing, changing, changing years. The Accrington Pals. School days end, the lads all went to work. Some spinning, some weaving in the sheds. On the land or down the pit, working hard to earn their daily bread. And they all went walking up old Pendle Hill On 
Sundays the lark sang high above the dales Little Willie Riley played his mandolin and sang They were laughing, they were smiling then The Accrington Pals 1916 came the call We need more lads to battle with the Hun Lads of Lancashire heed the call With God on our side the battle will soon be won So they all came marching to the beating of the drums Down from the fields and factories they'd come Smiling at the girls who came to see them on their way They were marching, marching, marching away The Accrington Pals Sky shining on that perfect day Larks were singing high above the sun Brothers fans and fathers lay Watching that sweet bird sing in the quiet of the dawn And they all went walking out towards the howling guns Talking and laughing, calmly walking on Believing in the lies that left them dying in the mud And they're lying, lying, lying still The Accrington Pals Smoky town that heard the news down in the valley, smoky little streets Houses quiet and curtains drawn All round the town a silent shroud of grief And the larks were singing still above old Pendle Hill The wind was in the bracken and the sun was shining still The larks were singing sweetly as Evening fell upon the sun And Edward Parkinson, Bobby Anderson, Billy Clegg, Johnny Malloy, Norman Jones, Albert Betty, Willie Riley, the Accrington Pound. It's a selection of two tunes, really. The first one is called She Moved Through the Fair, and it's a beautiful, slow Irish air. Uh, there were some words put to it by an Irish poet called James Stevens. So I'll play that for a while, and then I'll play a tune called Hitler's Downfall. Truthfully, that's what it's called. It's an Irish fiddle tune, a jig. And then I go back into the tune She Moved Through the Fair. It's uh, a suite of music, really, in uh, three pieces. So it's a three-piece suite. <laughs> Right. She moved through the fair and Hitler's downfall. Thank you. 
This next song is about the first time you ever take a girl home and meet her mum and dad. Or if you're a lass, it's about the first time you ever bring a lad home to meet the folks. What a horrible experience that is. <laughs> Isn't it? You get back from the pictures first time you're about 17 years old, you just shave round all the acne that night and... <laughs> you've got bits of toilet paper stuck on the volcanoes you've hit, you know. And you get her home, you've been to the pictures, you get back to their doorstep. It's the middle of a big estate somewhere, say, and you get there on the doorstep, and she stood at the door, and you're stood there, and you think, oh dear, what do I say now? Because you really fancy her, you really, really do fancy her, you know. And you say, uh, did you, um, did you, um, um, did you, um, uh, enjoy it tonight, did you? And she says, uh, yes, it was all right. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was great, me. I enjoyed it. Uh, can I, um, can I, um, can I, um, can I um, see you again, can I? If you want to. <laughs> well, uh, do you want me to? It's up to you. Do you want to? <laughs> well, I, I want to if you want me to, like, you know what I mean? Well, if you want to. <laughs> uh, yes, I'd like to see you again. All right, then, if you want to. <laughs> right, what about Friday? Next Friday. I can't. My friend's coming round and we're washing our hair. <laughs> it used to be a great excuse. <laughs> what about Saturday? I can't. My auntie's coming out of prison on that day. <laughs> um, but what about Sunday then? Sunday's all right. After church. Right, great. OK, I'll see you outside Marks and Spencer's. Half past seven. All right. Yes, all right, if you want to. <laughs> yes, I do want to. All right, if you do. And you think, right, it's Kissington's time now. <laughs> and you don't really know how to go about it. Because, of course, you tell your mates at school, don't you? Oh, me last Saturday, wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but you've never even kissed anybody. And you go, uh, right, I, I better be going in a minute then. <laughs> and you move the hands up and just get them with lips, and you both go, boom, bang your nose. <laughs> And then you start kissing. And it's that horrible, hard-lipped kissing, you know. Because nobody's, nobody's told you about tongues yet. 
<laughs> so you got your mum's like that, and she's got hers like that, and you're going. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> And your chin's a red roar, aren't you? <laughs> and every so often you're breaking off for a breath of air, you're going... <sighs> and there's all daft things going through your mind, like you notice that the paint's all peeling off the door, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a really good grip, you get hold of the door knocker and you stand on tiptoe because she's on the step and your knees are going and the milk bottles are rattling. <laughs> <laughs> you get hold of the door knocker and you're going... <clears throat> And you're kissing her like, mm. and she says, stop it. <laughs> you're getting yourself going. <laughs> I'm not, it's me anky in me pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and well, it doesn't matter, we can't stand here all night because the neighbours will watch and my mum will go mad. Why don't you come in and have a cup of tea? Oh, all right. And meet me mum and dad. Oh. Uh, no, I better be going for my bus. I don't want to, you know, I'll be... Do, I'll get... No, come in and meet me mum and dad. No, no. Come on. No, they, they won't like me. They will. No, they won't. They will. No, they won't. They will. And you go in and they bloody don't. <laughs> dad. Her dad hates you. He hates you because he knows exactly what you're after. <laughs> he was the same man himself 19 years before. He knows what you're... He takes one look and thinks, hell, fire. <laughs> I'm not leaving these two alone tonight. I've not finished paying for that arthrug yet. No chance. <laughs> and look at him. Look at the state of him. Looks like he's got a box of frogs down the front of his trousers. Look at him. <laughs> And you get introduced and you say, Hello, Mr. Thompson. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Very nice to meet you. And I just brought Susan home from the pictures that. And you sit down on the settee. And let me draw the picture for you if I can. Sort of, I don't know, corpy house or a little semi, say. And they've got a settee, chair, uh, dog and cat asleep on the hearth rug, cream tiled 1953 style fireplace, brass ornaments all over the top of it, brass sort of crocodiles you can crack nuts with, brass windmills, <laughs> brass boots full of spills, brass cartridges with all the bills in them. And then over the fireplace there's a green Korean lady from Boots. You know. <laughs> a brass plaque with what, what is a mother on it stuck on the wall, all the business. And you sit down on the settee. Now the springs are bust on the settee, so the minute you sit down, your knees are higher than your head. They're up there like that. <laughs> You're like a praying mantis in a teddy boy suit, right? So. <laughs> but there's only that place to sit because that is the only seat left in the house. The only other one is his chair. And nobody's allowed to sit on his chair. You can tell it's his chair because it's near the fire, facing the television. It's got brill cream marks all over the back and fag burns down the arm. His <laughs> chair. So you sat there. Dog and cat, dad in his chair. Fire roaring up the chimney back, cold February night, right? Mother on this side, daughter on this side, and there then follows an evening of the most miserable, utterly embarrassing silences that you've ever experienced in your whole life. You're sat there and you think, I'm going to have to talk, say something. Um, it's not been a bad day today, Mr. Thompson, has it? Hey, you know what I mean? It's not been bad, considering, I mean, it didn't start snowing till half past one this afternoon, did it? You know what I mean? And, and that thunder and lightning had finished by 12, hadn't it? You know, so... It's not been bad, really, you know what I mean? <sighs> um, bye, we saw, uh, we saw um, a great picture tonight, didn't we? Well, great picture, wasn't it, Susan, eh? Fabulous picture it was. Great picture. Oh, I. Yeah, it was brilliant. It really was brilliant, wasn't it, Susan? Brilliant. What was it called? Uh, the King of the uh, Khyber Rifles. What was it about? You don't know, you were facing the other way all night. You <laughs> Uh, it was about a king and he had some rifles and these kybers were trying to get them off him. And, uh... <laughs> and the mam says, right, I'll just make us all some supper then before we go to bed. She goes in the kitchen and comes out a quarter of an hour later with some tea and some cake. Now, I want to ask a question now. Where do these women, these mothers, get this cake from? Where does it come from? <laughs> they must have a secret recipe unbeknownst to anybody else because it's like moon rock, you can't eat it. <laughs> You take one bite, it starts to grow inside your head, it's good. 
and it sticks everywhere. It's up the back of your nose, back of your tongue, inside your... And it won't go away. You're chewing it and chewing it and chewing it. No, no, it's going to be very nice. Then she brings the tea in, and I swear to the Lord that they do this on purpose. I swear they get the cup and saucer and get a blow lamp on it first so it's red hot. <laughs> and they fill it with red hot tea and red hot milk, and they bring it in. She's got a welder's mitt. She gives it to you, and you go, oh, 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 oh. And yet the only place you can do is balance it on your lap, and you're trying to look relaxed while you're choking to death on this cake with half a pint of scalding hot liquid, a hair's breadth from your wedding tackle. You're suddenly going, oh, And you think, right, I'll have a drink of tea, I'll have to have a drink of tea, that'll shift it, that'll wash it down. Fatal mistake. Because that tea, as soon as it hits that cake, accelerates the growth rate, doesn't shift it. It's that... And at that very moment, her dad decides to talk to you. Where are you from, you? Well, I know where my wife and daughter are from. They live here with me, you pillock. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yes. Um, I was just... Uh, <clears throat> I was a bit of a bone in my tea. Um, it's very nice cake, that, Mrs. Thompson. Can I have the recipe for my mum? I'll give it to my mum. She can poison them rats with it. It's great stuff. <laughs> cake. Uh, me, I'm, I'm from Crumsel. Uh, Miss Crumsel? Isn't that where they eat the young, Crumsel? Bury the dead, stood up in bus queues with their hands out. No, oh, it's not that bad, it's comfortable, it's all right, it's not that bad. All right. What time's your bus back home then? Um, oh, I've missed it. You have to walk then, won't you? Yes, I will. You got work in the morning? Yes, I have. You best be gone then, aren't you? Well, I'll go in a minute, I'll, I'll just finish my tea and my cake, you know what I mean? It's, it's lovely, it really is lovely cake, this Mr. Thompson. It's, very nice, thank you. I, you know, I'll not keep anybody up, like, you know. <sighs> and then it goes quieter and quieter. And you say, that's a good painting, that Mr. Thompson, you know. You can always tell a good painting like that and that Van Gogh chair, you know, that chair he did. You can always tell a good painting because the eyes follow you around the room wherever you go. You know what I mean? Chair hasn't got any eyes, has it? <laughs> no, but if it did have, they'd follow you around the room, you know what I mean? It's, oh, God. Well, that's a great fireplace, that. That's a great fireplace, that, Mr. Thompson. You can't, the craftsman made them. I bet all them joints and cracks are exactly the same size, you know what I mean? <sighs> that coal's burning well. For coal, you know what I mean? <laughs> what did you say? I said, for coal. <laughs> I thought you said something. I did, I said, for coal. <laughs> all right, I just asked. I'm sure you said something. It goes <laughs> and it goes quieter and quieter and quieter and you can feel all these mad giggles building up inside you. You're going to go off in a minute. And then the dog goes into its party trick. The dog's on the hearth rug and he gets his back leg and it bends it right up behind its neck and bends itself double. And in a position it takes an Indian mystic a lifetime to achieve. It very carefully and tenderly starts to lick its town halls. You know? <laughs> and there's nowhere else to look. You... It's centre stage with a spotlight on. You can't move. You go. Oh. You think I'm gonna have to say something? I'll go potty here. Uh, it's a clever dog, that Mr. Thompson. <laughs> I, it's been able to do that since it were a pup, you know. <laughs> no, I wasn't being funny or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, it must be supple, you know what I mean? It must be fit, them dogs, you know, that have good back muscles. I mean, you know, it's nearly bent. Double that dog, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, I mean, I wish I could do that. <laughs> he said, well, give it a bit of cake, it might let you. And you can feel yourself getting hotter and hotter and more and more embarrassed. And then the dog goes into the finale of the show. It rolls on its back, wiggles its paws in the air, turns over on its little tummy, 
puts his little head on its little paws and drops a cracker. <laughs> and the trouble with dogs is they don't make any noise, do they? Have you noticed? They... <laughs> they don't, do they? They just sort of go, foot. <laughs> and the... the only way you know anything's happened is that everybody's eyes start to water at the same time. <laughs> And it's the only thing that gets her dad moving. Well, I'm for my bed now, I'm... <laughs> and he staggers off. Staggers off into the kitchen, banging his head on the wall, you know. <laughs> Comes out with his ice cream, he says... Cross the alarm clock and the hot water bottle, like... Hot water bottle under here. Now, the alarm clock, the winding of the alarm clock is a ritual as old as time. The winding of the alarm clock is supposed to signify that you are supposed to go. It must date back right into prehistory that. I bet the Romans came in with sundials under their arms and the daughters had boyfriends and going, oh, yam some bed um some est. <laughs> and caveman must have come in with a cockerel wringing its neck. Well, I'm for me bed now. <laughs> Ten. No. Because he's there, winding the clock. Well, right, I'm for me bed now, mother. Uh, put the cat out. And that blooming dog, put that out or not. <laughs> Don't give it no more of that vest of curry, mother. Or if you do, give it some water with it. You shouldn't give it dry like that. I think you have to cook it or something. Wind, 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 wind. Don't forget you got work in the morning now, Susan. I know I have, Dad. Ah, well, don't forget. I knew a young man. You got a long walk home. Wind, wind, wind. Well, Mother, you better lock up as soon as I've gone and make sure everybody's out and the fire guard's up. You know what I mean? Wind, wind, wind. And don't forget, young man, you got a long walk home. Wind, wind. I, I know. I'll, I'll just finish my tea and, and my cake. And I, I don't want to keep anybody up. Well, you're not keeping anybody up. Don't worry. Right, I'll go in a minute then. I will. Right. Wind, wind, wind. I'll not be long, I'll just finish. Wind, wind. Right, oh. And he winds it up so much he breaks it. <laughs> I had so many fathers break alarm clocks. I used to get fan mail from Timex. <laughs> and that gets him barmy, that is. Right, I'm from my bed then. That's me. Come on, mother, you better make sure everybody's out before you go. Right, I'm going up. Storms off up to bed. Really angry. Can't throw you out properly. It goes off. Then the mother stands up and she says, Right, old Susan, I'm going up to bed now. Now, don't you go stopping up late, young lady. You know what your father's like. You heard what he said. You've got work in the morning. I know I have, ma'am. Don't you answer me back, young lady. You're too clever by far, you are. You can't go burning your candle at both ends. I thought I've not burnt mine at one yet. I don't know what <laughs> she said, right, I'll be up there about two minutes. I'm coming down. I'll be dressed and ready to lock the house up. Now, don't you go stopping up late. All right, ma'am. She goes off. Now, this is not a male chauvinist remark by any stretch of the imagination. But a woman goes upstairs and a thing comes back down again. <laughs> Terrified. She's got the quilted house coat on, slippers with pom-poms, stockings rolled down around her ankles, gorgonzola legs, <laughs> hot rollers in, teeth out, knitted poodle full of toilet rolls under this arm, <laughs> hot water bottle and a Mills and Boone book in this hand. She's like a semi-literate werewolf stood at the bottom of the stairs. You think you should have garlic and a crucifix? Back! Get back! Because she may not be able to bite you, but she could gum you to death. <laughs> and she comes and she says, Right, I'm going to stick some sticks in my tongue. Don't you go see me? Don't you find sticks in my tongue? Don't you find sticks in my tongue? Don't you find I know you, but don't try to see me, but sticks in my tongue. Don't you find sticks in my tongue? Was that your mum? <laughs> of course it was. Really? Come in here. Well, I'd, um, I'd better be gone now then, hadn't I? I mean, I don't want any trouble, like, you know what I mean? You know, and, and, that, and your mum seemed angry, I'd better go. No, you're all right. Well, hadn't I better go? No, you'll be all right, they're always like that. Don't worry, they're only worried about me, but I'll have to be upstairs in an hour, because otherwise my dad starts banging his boots on the bedroom floor and you can hear him. An hour? Yes, I'm all right for an hour. Are you sure? Yes, of course. Really, 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 really sure? Yes, of course I am. I'm all right for an hour. Yes. Oh. <laughs> you put your cup and sauce of the cake down and the hand starts going on its own. You can't stop it. Powerless now. It's an automatic pilot. <laughs> it's going around the back, down the, looking for the cuddly bits with the pointed ends. It's going. <laughs> Inside the blazer, inside the cardigan, round the neck, undo a button of the blouse, inside the blouse. Inside the vest. 
inside the Liberty Bodies. <laughs> it's bringing back a lot of memories, this is like... <laughs> and you get your watch caught on the bra strap and you can't move it. Stuck. <laughs> and you think, I'll pretend it isn't happening, I'll go, I'll go start on the legs. That'll, that. So you get the hand on the knee and then start to slide it ever so gently up the thigh. And then you realise it's your own, so you move it across. And... <laughs> And then it's, then it's arms locked in immortal combat. You, you struggle and squeezing and, and blowing in each other's ears. <laughs> nibbling loads, <laughs> chewing the back of the neck. <laughs> oh, and it's touchy, touchy and squeezing. Whoa, dip your head. And then you roll off the tee onto the hearth rug and it's a very careful operation. It's what you do is you get your knee off like that and then you get elbow off and then you sort of roll. Try it tonight when you get home. You sort of roll back. And, you get on the hearth rug and it's all hands across the sea, everything, you knock the dog out of the way, oh, there's the fire roaring, oh, it's and then you start, this is it, this is it, shazam, journey into space, and you stand up, drop your trousers and your trolleys and take one step back. A fatal mistake, because the cat is the same colour as the hearth rug. <laughs> you, step... <laughs> you step back and the cat goes, yes! <laughs> and the dad comes flying downstairs. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> you stood there with your trousers and your trolleys around your ankles and a ginger muff spitting around your neck. <laughs> I, I, I just got up to go home and my braces snapped and the cat was frightened. I just... <laughs> right, our Susan, get up to bed right away now. I should have known damn well this would have happened up to bed now. Oh, Dad, that's enough. Get upstairs and get to bed right away, young lady. And as for you, young man, oh, fire. Oh. <laughs> Looks like a bloody pickaxe. I don't know. <laughs> As for you, get to bed. I mean, get out of my house. Out of my house. Right, I can explain everything, Mr. Thompson. The braces snapped, the cat was frightened. It's been lovely being here. It's out of my house now. Well, thanks very much for the tea and the cake. It was very nice indeed. I'm, I'm, get out of my house now before I battle you. Oh, right. Okay, if that's your attitude, I better be gone then. Thank you very much for a lovely evening. Boom. And you run off down the garden path, running like sugar off a shovel. But dying. <laughs> and you're tearing down the avenue, down the avenue, across the road, running down the main street. You're going, oh, God. Oh God, I've got to get killed. I couldn't, you could have murdered me. Oh, blimey. What a stupid thing to do. What a stupid... Well, you were lucky to get away with that. But you haven't got away with it. Because the cat, for being trod on, has had its revenge. It's cracked in the hood of your double coat. <laughs> <laughs> and you're walking down the road, you're going... <laughs> <laughs> you're stopping on the lamps, you're going... And it's a freezing cold February night. <laughs> oh, the wind's a bit... And the old ears, well, we get the hood up like... <laughs> I never had curly hair till that night. <laughs> I like telling that story because as I'm telling it, you look around the audience, you see waves of recognition. <laughs> you talk about the cake, you see lads all going, I remember that cake. <laughs> and when you get to the settee bit, you see all the girls are going, so they are all like that. <laughs> all the wonderful bits, I'll be careful, honest. I'll only put it in a bit, you know, all that business. Anyway, a song I wrote. <laughs> if, they, if they don't get it, don't tell them, we'll be here all night, you're explaining. Right. A song I wrote about going home with a young lady for the first time, and it's called Mr. O'Grady. There's no chorus, so don't join in otherwise you look potty, right? OK? <laughs> Here we go. Mr. O'Grady. She's been featured on a new album which is coming out on the Oblivion label tomorrow. <laughs> called Enoch Powell's Sings Tamla Motown. That's the title. Right? <laughs> OK. OK, fingers. Right. OK. Right. Mr. O'Grady, I took your daughter to the pub It was nice and snug We had a couple of beers, now we're standing here at your back door The cold winds roar, Mr. O'Grady As we stand here, the gales they blow It's freezing cold 
She says you won't let her take men inside the house, you rotten louse Mr. O'Grady, I wish that you were dead I can see your ball dead over the chair and you don't give a bugger up Mr. O'Grady, me and your daughter bought some chips to defrost our lips So we could cuddle and snuggle, now your blooming dog's beat up me leg I plead and beg Mr. O'Grady, as we stand here in your backyard It's freezing hard We're jumping up and down, you've got to laugh, it's the only jump we'll have <laughs> Oh Mr. O'Grady, I wish that you were dead I can see your ball dead over the chair and you don't give a bugger up Mr. O'Grady, you rotten dozy blooming prat Your blooming cat has just used me legs as a ladder It's abseil down me now cos I'm going crack <laughs> Mr. O'Grady, the blooming dawn is breaking now I'm aching now I think I'm going to fall if I'd known it was going to be like this, I'd never have married her at all. Thank you. Thank you. What happens? What happens to that couple? That couple that could not stand to be parted for five minutes, used to write each other love poetry and, and love letters, and they would walk home arm in arm, squeezed so tight together they'd have bruises on the rips, you know. <laughs> and they used to spend all night saying good night on the doorstep. What happens to them? What makes them so potty that they have a little row about nothing on earth and they stop talking to each other? Like big soft kids, they're not talking. <laughs> Trying to pass each other in the hall without looking at each other. And lying in bed at night with 18 inches in between them, you know. <laughs> you get me and bother, you will. Uh... <laughs> and if, if one of them happens to, you know, the back-to-back, -back, and if one of them happens to just sort of in the sleep, roll over and touch the other, they go, no, no, no. <laughs> And then what else do you get? Deaf and, deaf and dumb breakfast. That's marvellous, that is. Deaf and dumb breakfast. Come down, sit there, all sat around the table. Tell your father to pass the salt. <laughs> What's the matter with you? What's the matter with me? That is rich. That is good, that is. That is wonderful. You definitely are a comedian, you definitely. My mother said never to trust you. Your eyes were too close together. <laughs> Close together, they were plotted when you came in this house last night. <laughs> you tried to get upstairs, it was up down business. You fell over, you got half a bottle of whiskey in your back trouser pocket, smashed it to pieces, you cut your backside to ribbons. An hour and a half, you were stood in front of that dressing table mirror, sticking plasters on. And you go and look, there's all plasters all over the mirror. Ridiculous. You were only in bed, in bed, half an hour. You got up, you started getting dressed again. I said, where are you going? He said, is it that time the wife will bloody kill me? <laughs> so I decided to write a love song. <laughs> and I didn't really know what metier I was going to use, you know, what form it was going to take. And then I was in the van with my mate Dave, driving along there, and I came into contact with CB Radio for the first time. I don't know if we've got any breakers in tonight or any good buddies. Are there any good buddies in tonight? Oh well, oh well, oh well, oh well. Oh well. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to the radio too, I think. It's about two o'clock in the morning, we've got this trucker's special and they use all these sort of lingo, because I didn't know what it was. I'm in the cab with Dave, my mate there, Rody Dave, and we're driving down the slab, as he calls it, the motorway, and it's one o'clock, and I always like to listen to the news, keep myself informed, topical and all that. So I thought I'd put the radio on and listen to Robin Day on the World at One. 
and I hit the wrong button and hit the CB radio and all of a sudden I got one nine for a copy, one nine for a copy, come on, copy, 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 put your ears on, come on, break a break, breaker on the side, come on, let's have a breaker, come on now, one nine for a copy, and somebody said, you got a copy, you got a copy, okay, we'll go down the box, we'll go down the box, one four, okay, we'll have a ratchet, okay, give you all the high numbers, good buddy, okay, okay, what are you pushing, I'm pushing the big rig, what are you pushing, pregnant roller skate, how's your twig? <laughs> I said, uh, is this Robin Day? He said, no, he said, it's Ratchet. I said, it sounds like people talking to me. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, no, he said, it's a CB expression for talking Ratchet. He said, they're, they're having Ratchet. And he told me all the expressions. I couldn't believe it. The slab is the motorway. Motion lotion is diesel. Smokey Bear are the police. Don't, don't call them that. They don't like it. Smokey Bear, the police. And eyeball, eyeball. When you meet somebody after you've been talking to them on the radio, you say, eyeball, eyeball. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> It means hello, you know, eyeball, eyeball. And he don't say it to anybody with a squint, they get upset, like, you know. <laughs> and you, a pregnant roller skate is a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> it's poetic, that isn't it, eh? You know, shall I compare thee to a pregnant roller skate? Don't look. <laughs> and then you've got um, your twig. Your twig is the aerial. I thought it was rude, that, but it isn't. The twig is the aerial on top of the cab that picks up all the signals off the skip. And the skip is the airwaves. Marvellous, total new meta language, this is. And then you've got rude bits as well. There's some very... I don't really think I should tell you what... Well, I will. Um, <laughs> beaver. Beaver is an expression you very often hear. Uh, beaver. Well, um, the little furry thing's about that big and, and, uh, and that. I don't know much more about them, but somebody told me that in Canada they eat trees, in which case I'm not going there. <laughs> um, what else is there? Oh, yes. Uh, what's your 20 means where are you. Square wheels means that you're, you're stuck, you're not moving yourself. And then there's another rude one I forgot, nearly. Another rude one. In fact, the rudest one of them all is um, giving it all the eights. Give you all the eights. It's, it means... Oh, oh, God. It means basically... <laughs> it means... Uh, will you dip your bread? That's what it means. <laughs> That's probably where they get after eight mints from. I never thought of that. <laughs> Take the taste away. It's amazing what they think about nowadays. <laughs> so I decided to write a CB love song with all the lingo in it. And I've written one called The Ballad of Slack Alice. Now, Slack Alice was a lady who lives uh, near my mate Dave up in the Wigan 20. And um, <laughs> we know a girl from Brig. Shouldn't really tell you this, but the girl from Brig, not very far from here, as you know. But there's a girl from Brig, she has a handle, like a CB name. Um, and I'm the cuddly owl and Dave's the big bopper. And this girl from Brig is called um, Titanic. <laughs> because she went down with so many men. That's what they call her. That. <laughs> I think, I think. Anyway, the chorus goes, keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches. 10, 10, till we do it again. Bye, bye, and I'm gone. Take it away. Okay, hit it. Hot diggity. Shookins, y'all. Hell yeah. <laughs> right. Here we go. Every country and western song you've ever heard starts off like this and goes on for hours and hours and hours. And then sort of every so often it sort of goes. And then it doesn't matter who's singing, it doesn't matter where they're from, they could be from Scotland, Ireland, England, the Island Man, Newcastle, Nottingham, wherever. They get on stage and they'll use their own accent and they'll say things like... Uh, me and the boys are going to do a great wee song for you now. It's a wee stoter, it's a stoter, so it is. Drink on a stick. It's my granny's well, it's a great wee song, so it is. It's a belter. Okay, lads, aye, great, so it is. Are you ready? Aye, so I am. Aye, so are you. Aye, so it is. Right, great, so it is. Here we go then, right, boys, take it away. Okay, away we go. See, a wee slim Whitman number, great little number. Okay, boys, here we go. Then he starts singing, he goes, I was born down in Tucson, Alabama. <laughs> so, there's not wrong with me, I'm just supposed to sing it with this sort of uh, mid-Atlantic accent, man, the knows. <laughs> well, hell yeah. This is the story of the Great North Road where the truckies haul those heavy loads. Tale of busted tappets, love and lust. 
story of a girl they call Slack Alice in a place they call the Medicine Palace where a truckie called Roger the Lodger bit the dust. That night the skip was bad, there was no good buddies on the slab. His eyes were heavy, every muscle in his body was throbbing. He felt a bit of a bump, but he drove on thinking he'd hit a lump. But he flattened a chauffeur-driven Reliant Robin. <laughs> Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches, ten, ten, till we do it again, bye, bye, and I'm gone. Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches, ten, ten, till we do it again, bye, bye, and I'm gone. Hell yeah. He blew the doors off a pregnant roller skate, and then he heard a break, a break. It was that good lady whose handle was like Alice. Well, that sweet thing could wretch it plenty, and when he asked her what was her twenty, she was on square wheels outside the Medicine Palace. To the Medicine Palace he went that night, he could see the lights for miles and miles. He was burning rubber to answer Slack Alice's call. Well, he pulled him off the slab and he jumped down from out of his cab. And she was waiting there, shouting, Eyeball, eyeball! Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye, bye, and I'm gone. Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye, bye, and I'm gone. Well, the lodger, he was eager when it came to tailing beaver When he saw Slack Alice's eyes went swiveling round There was no room in the cab, so they just lay them down on the slab Beneath that truck on a blanket on the ground Pretty soon they were in overdrive and doing about 175 She was biting his nose and shouting rude words at him He was giving it all the eights when he looked up and saw a pair of feet It was Smokey Bear with a torch looking grim Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your bridges. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye bye and I'm gone. Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your bridges. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye bye and I'm gone. He said, Good evening, sir. This is Smokey Bear. Now, what in the hell do you think you're doing down there? Going away like two rabbits in a hutch. He said, This ain't what you're thinking. As I drove on, I heard something clinking. I just climbed under here for to inspect my clutch. Smokey Bear, he didn't say much, seven. I don't know about your clutch, but that's the worst goddamn excuse I've ever been told. Negatory, sir, cos if I was you, then I think I'd check my brakes too. We've just found your truck seven miles down the road. <laughs> keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye bye, and I'm gone. Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your britches. Ten, ten, till we do it again, bye bye, and I'm gone. Well, the lodger shouted rubber duck and he ran off to go and find his truck. He was in a ditch and the wheels were swiveling round. And the lodger, he got busted that night cause Smokey Bear did him good and right. Took his rig and fined him 500 pounds. So you truckies keep clear of the Medicine Palace and that good lady they call Slack Alice. Cause that's one night the lodger won't ever forget. Cause ever since then his twig's been bent and he's been using liniment. Been six months and he ain't stopped scratching yet. <laughs> well, keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your bridges. Ten, ten, till we do it again. Bye, bye, and I'm gone. Keep your wheels out of the ditches, keep the bears out of your bridges. Ten, ten, till we do it again. Bye, bye, and I'm gone. Far out. Right. Right. Uh, le maintenant, uh, le moment est arrivé, mesdames et messieurs. Pour jouer la guitare électrique et donner vous GBH de logo. Avec beaucoup de noise, et play le rock and roll Nespa. Mena dominant heron, yeah.
motorbike, big motorbike Going down the road on my big motorbike, oh yeah I said, oh yeah You wanna grab my jacket, zoom my jacket, zoom my jacket, zoom my jacket, I'm going to do a rock and roll song for you now. A song I wrote when I was in Wolverhampton last year. Uh, missionary service, you know. <laughs> uh, and at a great time, there was two lads helped us in with the gear. Um, when we go anywhere, there's always eight tonne of lights and sound that have to be grabbed and dragged in the halls wherever we are. And every time we go to a hall in a town, we have to ask the hall to provide us with a couple of guys that are called humpers and they help us hump in the gear in. You have to explain that because any Americans in the audience have a different meaning for the word humping. <laughs> There's no use saying me and the lads met these two lads who were humping for us <laughs> in Wolverhampton. So in Wolverhampton, two Hells Angels turned up dressed like this. They came running in the hall on big huge, you know, motorbikes, Kawasaki's and Harley Davidson's. And they got off and they had tattoos everywhere and oh, you know. And I thought, blimey, O'Reilly. And then I started talking to them, and they were the two of the nicest lads you've ever met in your life. They were really quiet, sort of shy lads, the sort that would help old ladies across the road into pubs and all this business. <laughs> and so I was talking to one of them that evening, I said, uh, I said, what do you do, you old angels? I said, do, you, do you kill people, like? <laughs> and he said, no, he said, it's a lot of rubbish, that he says. He said, uh, we're uh, more mate, and maybe we just, uh, we get on those bikes like, you know, he says, and we just, uh, we just burn rubber, you know, we just drive up and down the slab, you know, and uh, we drive to the seaside, you know, skaggy and places like that, you know. We uh, build a bonfire on the beach and we get drunk and sing songs and fall over. <laughs> I thought it sounds a bit like Princess Margaret in Mustique, this, you know. She <laughs> <laughs> an angel, you know. I said, don't you really kill nobody? He said, no, nah, no, I said, no, he says, it's just great being a hell's angel, like, you know. And he really was a nice guy. But then I had a look at him, and he was about, about 35, I suppose, but he's tattooed everywhere. I'm going to say everywhere without going into too graphic detail. I would say everywhere. Parts of his anatomy that probably his mum had seen, that's all. Tattoos everywhere. You know, behind his neck, I mean. And I thought to myself, well, what happens to these old angels when they get to 65? I mean, what do they do? I mean, is there an old age pension home for Hells Angels or...? <laughs> Do they all retire to Cleethorpes or Skeggy and go in motorised wheelchairs up and down the front, terrorising all the old rich people? <laughs> Putting sand in the Vaseline and things like that. I thought, what could go on up there? You never know. So I've written this song, it's called It's Hard To Be An Angel When You're 65. I'm going to say no more apart from just watch this right leg, because this right leg actually plays the drums. Spenny more, but this right leg actually <laughs> plays the drums. Here we go. How to be an angel when you're 65? It's hard to be an angel when you're 65 The oil's running out of my life I used to be an angel, a cherub with a chopper But now I'm just a ton of crap And me and my old lady, we go down to the coast See the other angels there In lots, we sit down on the beach Drinking fill the sun in the deck chair I'm now me Rocker box is knocking me, sump is running dry I have to let milk flow, go past I'm going so slow, I'm nearly in reverse The only thing I've plenty of is gas And we used to be the terrors of the highway Burning rubber and doing a ton Now I have to take me tablets every half an hour And keep the thermal underwear on And we used to rave it up till the early dawn Losing and having a thrash I used to open bottles with me tea but now I keep me teeth in a glass And now me Rocker box is knocking Me something's running dry I have to let milk flow go past I'm going so slow I'm nearly in reverse The only thing I've let me up is gas
And we used to bite the eggs of chickens and ducks And keep all the cops on the run Now I can't bite the eggs of chocolate mice And even custard hurts my gums And we used to burn rubber with all the other angels Riding for miles and miles Now I have to get off every half an hour To put some more cream on me piles <laughs> Now me rock a boxy knocking There's something running dry I have to let milk flow so fast I'm going so slow, I'm nearly in the bus. The only thing that let me up is gas. And I used to be chatted all over the place. On me back I had a map of the world. On me chest was a tattoo of skull thorn. Down below was a curly eddy girl. On me arm was a skull and crossbones. And down below the Waterloo line. It used to say Lamb don't know, but now it just says Ludo 95% of the time. <laughs> now, me, rock a box is knocking me something running dry. I have to let milk flow go fast. I'm going so slow, I'm nearly in reverse. The only thing I'm plenty of is plenty of gas. Thank you very much. We used to always finish on that number, but then we'd bring the house lights up and find dead people all over the front. <laughs> Eleven rows chokes and blown apart. And Napoleon blown apart. <laughs> and people like, stop it brain, okay. And other people had had accidents because of the noise and the smoke and that. And <laughs> they, they'd be sat there going, I've worked this heat, I can't move. <laughs> so to give you a decent and honorable time to slope out without anybody saying, <laughs> I'll um, do another song. I don't usually do encores or anything like that because to me, when you're finished, you're finished. I'm not like one of these big sort of US stars like, you know, uh, Shirley Bassey and all that who sort of say, uh, oh, this is so unexpected, you know, and come back on and the orchestra will start playing something they've been learning all afternoon. Um, I, can't, I can't do all that business, you know. I don't particularly like all that showbiz lark. So I usually go off and that's the end of it. But like I say, because of all these dead people, I've had to come back on. And... Um, because really, to me, you know, I, I sort of run off sweating and, and happy and finished, I've done it, you know. And then somebody there saying, get back on, get back on. Well, you wouldn't like it if you came home from work and somebody said, get back to work, get back to work. <laughs> get back to work. <laughs> Open my teeth, get back to work. Get back. <laughs> and then again, trying to get you all whipped up again, it's, it's really hard, you know, trying to get you all aroused. It's a bit like the, the postman coming when you're making love, you know. <laughs> Which is all right if you're married to a postman, I suppose. But anyway, this is... <laughs> God really is doing it. Ah, well, don't, no. <laughs> But well, this is a, a quiet, a quiet end of the night song, really. That's just a way of saying good night and God bless and thanks a lot. I'd like to dedicate to a little little boy called Chris Silver, who's asked me to mention his name. So there you are. I've mentioned your name, Chris Silver. Got a dad called Long John. No, he never. <laughs> I shouldn't bother with that one. That was terrible. Even I thought that. The song's called Rolling Home. It's got a chorus that goes Rolling Home, Rolling Home. Now the night's over. It's time to be gone. Rolling Home, Rolling Home. It's time to be rolling home. You got that? Oh, you've been wonderful tonight on the singing bit. <laughs> anyway, if you feel like singing along, great. Give it some rice. Over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. We've been on the long road and the stories near told. We've laughed, had to daft, been weary and cold, been drunk and been crazy, hung over and hazy. But now it's time to be rolling. Home. And we're rolling home, rolling home 
Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Have a go. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. We've been up, we've been down, and we've loonied around. Just like the circus, we've come to your town. But come one and come all for the parting glass calls. And it's time to be rolling home. And we're rolling home, rolling home. Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. And we've been all the places and seen all the faces. Met old friends, made new friends, had bangers, had cases. And we've sung through the night, even got a bit tight. A bit, that's a lot. And it's time to be rolling home. And we're rolling home, rolling home. Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. And we've seen the daybreak, seen the moon on the lakes. Driven so long, our bodies have ached. The time's hurried on. And it's time we were done. It's time to be rolling home. And we're rolling home, rolling home. Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. Thanks for having us tonight. Look after yourselves, take care. And don't let them grind you down, right? If anybody starts having a go at you, it doesn't matter who it is, the boss, your teacher, somebody in authority, starts giving you some stick, right? It really starts getting up your nose. Just imagine that whoever it is that's giving you all this pain is sat on the toilet. <laughs> you cannot take them serious after that. Don't try it with the police, it doesn't work with them. Everybody else does. Thanks for being a smart audience, you really have been great tonight, and that's an old bulk, right? But one last little thing I'd like to leave you with a thought that'll help you on your way through life. Traverse this weary path before us all. Brethren, I would like you to join hands and just remember this one thing. Remember, the best things in life are hairy. Remember that, brethren. So... Come one... And come all for the parting last calls. May your pleasures be many and your sorrows be small. And I'll raise up me beer. Wish you good luck, good health, and good cheer. For it's time to be rolling home. And we're rolling home, rolling home. Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. One more time. Rolling home, rolling home. Now the night's over, it's time to be gone. Rolling home, rolling home. It's time to be rolling home. Good night.